Hey friends, how you doing? Eric Euless here, yet again, to talk a little bit more about this mystery of D.B. Cooper. So, I was thinking, uh, after posting the video yesterday, that I should probably flesh out a little bit more my thoughts with respect to D.B. Cooper starting his day in Seattle. Now, I think it's important that you understand that officially, the FBI law enforcement has absolutely no idea how D.B. Cooper got to Portland Airport. Of course, he showed up there somehow, paid for a one-way ticket from Portland to Seattle with a $20 bill. And he did this not too long before the flight departed. And when I say not too long, my understanding is it was about an hour or so before the flight departed. Now, law enforcement did look into the parking lot there around the airport to see if there were any cars or anything of that nature that were overnight or, you know, if Cooper happened to perhaps drive himself there and just park the car there. Uh, they also talked with taxi drivers, bus drivers. Uh, they talked to people who work in the restaurants in the airport. They also talked to people who work at hotels and motels around the area to see if there was anybody who saw D.B. Cooper before the event took place to get some sort of idea of where this guy came from and how he got to PDX. And of course, ultimately, they came away empty-handed. There was absolutely nothing at all. So in my mind, this really leads to two possibilities. Uh, either A, he had an accomplice and he was just simply dropped off at the airport, which is a possibility. The other thing is that he flew in from somewhere else. Now, one thing that I think that is very notable that I think strongly points to D.B. Cooper starting his day in Seattle is the fact that he didn't have any luggage with him. Now, again, at first blush, people think, yeah, who cares? I mean, what's the big deal? So the guy didn't carry any luggage or what have you, didn't have any change of clothes or anything of that nature. Well, I think that's actually a very big deal, especially when you consider that D.B. Cooper attempted to be the very last person to board the jet in Portland and ended up being the second to last person to board the jet. And that, the reason for that is because uh, Bill Mitchell, there's a college student named Bill Mitchell who was running very late and at the very last instant grabbed a ticket from Portland to Seattle to go home for Thanksgiving. So Bill Mitchell ended up being the very last person to board the jet. It's also important to note that uh, there were no assigned seats on this particular flight outside of first class. So if you're flying in the coach section, it was really not too unlike Southwest Airlines is today. It's sort of a first come, first serve type of thing in terms of the seat that you grab. It's also critically important to note that the passengers on this flight actually boarded from the back air stairs that lowered down from the jet itself, from the back bottom of the fuselage. So the very steps, the very air stairs that D.B. Cooper later jumped from in mid-flight were the actual stairs that the passengers used to board the flight in Portland. So what this means is that when you walk aboard the jet, the very first row of seats you come to are the back row, row 18, the very back row, because you're boarding from the back and then you kind of move yourself forward there. So considering that D.B. Cooper was the second to last person to board and actually apparently intended to be the very last person to board, I've always asked the question, well, what happens if he gets on board the jet and he realizes that, realizes that those back two or three rows already have passengers sitting in them? Uh, what does Cooper do? Does he just find a seat somewhere in the middle of the cabin and try to affect a skyjacking from that point? Or does he just abort the attempt and try another day? I think it's very clear that if Cooper boarded the jet, he couldn't get that very back row, that he would have just aborted the attempt and tried another day. Because by having the back row, it's very easy for him. He can turn around, he can hand the note to the flight attendant who's sitting in that jump seat in the very back of the plane as the plane's taxing to the runway. He's got all the passengers and perceived threats in front of him, nothing's behind him. So he can comfortably affect the skyjacking being in the very back row, something that he, in my mind, I can't see him doing very well 
if he's seated somewhere in the middle of the plane. Okay, so let's assume he gets on board and the back rows have got a bunch of people sitting in the back, you know, the uh, college wrestling team or something like that, or, you know, maybe some buff guys or whatever the case may happen to be. I mean, in other words, people he doesn't want to mess around with. Uh, and that's a very real possibility. You never know. So he had to have some sort of plan B. And I would imagine that if that were the case, that he would have simply flown to Seattle like any other passenger, and he would have deboarded the plane in Seattle. But remember, he has no luggage, and it's one of, if not the last flight of the day. I won't say it's the last flight of the day to Seattle, but what I'm saying is by the time he gets to Seattle, if he wants to turn around, for example, and fly back, he may have a problem. I'm not so sure there's really a, a, a flight coming back to Portland that day. So what does he do? I'm, I'm theorizing that he already had something set up there, a motel or something already set up there. And if he had a motel or something already set up, well, that clearly points to him starting his day in Seattle with the motel, with a fresh change of clothes, all that good stuff there, flying to a Portland with no luggage, then turning right back around to skyjack the jet. So it makes perfect sense if he has to abort, he just simply walks off the plane, catches a taxi or what have you, an Uber, 1971 Uber, to his motel. Now the other thing is, obviously that didn't happen. He went ahead with the skyjacking because he did get a, a seat in the back row. The other thing that's critically, the other thing rather that's critically important to remember is that D.B. Cooper insisted that when they took off from Seattle and started flying south toward Reno and then apparently ultimately down to Mexico City, which of course I believe was a ruse, he insisted that those back air stairs that they boarded the jet with, that those things actually be down on takeoff. He literally wanted the air stairs dragging on the runway on the takeoff. Well, the pilots refused to take off that way, and there was some back and forth between Cooper and the pilots, and ultimately Cooper relented and said, sure, that's fine, I'll let you take off with the air stairs up, but as soon as that jet gets off the ground, we gotta lower those air stairs. So about five or 10 minutes goes by, and Cooper changes his mind again, and once again picks this thing up with the pilots and says, listen, I want the air stairs down on takeoff, and again, this conversation goes back and forth about that. At one point, they say that they can't do that, or at least Tina Mucklow says that they can't do that, apparently uh, forwarding a message from the flight deck. And Cooper says, yes, they can, as if he knew that they could do that. And indeed, the jet actually could take off that way. But nonetheless, D.B. Cooper, for a second time, relents, lets the pilots take off with the air stairs up, and they bolt. So for some reason, this guy was really adamant about that jet taking off with the air stairs down. So that's something very important to keep in mind. And I think the reason for that is not because he just felt like, you know what, let's just fly the jet down the Reno with the air stairs down for the hell of it for no good reason. I think that the reasons are crystal clear that what he had in mind was to actually jump shortly after taking off from Seattle. When I say shortly after taking off, I'm talking five or six minutes later, the jet would have been you know, in the exurbs or suburbs of Seattle. It also makes sense when you consider that D.B. Cooper did not provide any sort of flight path or flight instructions to the pilots with respect to how to fly. In fact, it wasn't until the very last moment that he even told them where the hell he wanted to go, i.e. Mexico. They had no idea. And people have speculated, you know, how could he not tell them which way to go? I mean, what does that mean in terms of him jumping? How could he possibly have known where he jumped? Well, the answer to the question is he couldn't. He couldn't have known with any kind of certainty the direction the jet was going to fly and ultimately where he was going to jump. The reasons for that are staring us right in the face, ladies and gentlemen. It's because he didn't give a damn. He didn't care. Again, in his mind, he's thinking, I'm going to jump out of this jet five or six minutes after the jet takes off, I know I'll be somewhere in the suburbs of Seattle. If it takes off to the south, which is what it did, I'll be somewhere near Tacoma. If it takes off to the north and you know makes a right-hand turn, I'll be jumping out somewhere near you know Duval or you know Issaquah or someplace like that. If the jet takes off and goes to the 
to the uh, west. Uh, you know, perhaps he jumps out and ends up over Bremerton or, or someplace like that. But the point is, is that he ends up in the suburbs of Seattle regardless of where the jet goes and it doesn't matter. Because if he has a motel already set up there, it's very easy. You just stash the cash temporarily wherever you happen to land, presumably, you know, in the woods or something like that. And you catch a taxi or whatever back to your motel. Get that change of clothes going on there. Like I said yesterday, get out of that D.B. Cooper uniform. You don't want to be walking around dressed like D.B. Cooper for too long. You know, jump in your rental car. I'm sure you had a rental car. You know, roll your way back to where the money was stashed, you know, an hour or so before. Pick it up, throw it in the trunk, and then, you know, head back to, to parts unknown, so to speak. So that is why I believe firmly that D.B. Cooper actually started his day in Seattle and ultimately ended up uh, planning on ending his day in Seattle with one, with one caveat. One of the things that I've thought about quite a bit relates to, you know, what does he do? I mean, you know, if he stays in Seattle there, especially when you consider that he referenced things to Seattle McCord is 20 minutes from SeaTac. Uh, he said he apparently recognized Tacoma down there. I mean, those are statements that pretty seem to pretty clearly indicate that this guy was familiar with the region. Well, it stands to reason at some point the authorities are going to say, hmm, maybe we should be looking around the Seattle area. The guy seemed to be familiar with it. So with that in mind, I think it, it makes sense to me that he wouldn't want to stick around Seattle really for any period of time at all. So my thought is that once he collects the cash that he stashed, puts it in the trunk of his you know rental car, he shoots back to SeaTac, checks the car in just like any other person. He's dressed obviously differently and boards a red-eye flight to parts unknown. And as I mentioned yesterday, there was one red-eye flight leaving Seattle, United Airlines flight about 10.30 that evening heading to JFK. So it makes a lot of sense to me, especially when you consider that by the time he gets on that jet in Seattle, and takes off and starts working his way back to JFK. It's about that time that the skyjacked airliner flight 305 is landing in Reno and law enforcement is just discovering that D.B. Cooper is actually no longer on the jet. So simply put, D.B. Cooper has got a very big head start on the authorities and if the plan had worked out the way he intended, I believe, again, this is my theory, think about that, think how beautiful that is. Law enforcement's just figuring out that the guy's not on the jet in Reno. Meanwhile, he's sitting in first class drinking probably another, you know, bourbon and 7-Up on a United Airlines flight overnight to JFK with 200 grand sitting in his luggage. It's a beautiful plan. And uh, hours later, he's on the other end of the country and who knows where he goes from there. So either way, those are my thoughts with respect to that. And that's why I feel and believe so adamantly that D.B. Cooper actually started his day in Seattle and actually intended on jumping in Seattle and then, quite frankly, before the day was over, getting his ass out of Seattle. So there we go. I just wanted to put that out there and uh, let's just chew on that for a little while. So a couple of things to think about before we go here that I think are of, are of note or interesting. First of all, uh, there is a book of matches that he depleted while he was smoking cigarettes, uh, Tina Mucklow was lighting his cigarettes for him. So he depleted a book of matches. He smoked eight cigarettes. He smoked either eight, seven or eight cigarettes. There were eight cigarette butts found. But the reason I think he may have only smoked seven is because Tina Mucklow actually shared a cigarette with him. They, they, he didn't share, she didn't share the cigarette. They each had their own cigarette. But the point is, is one of those eight could have been the one cigarette that Tina Mucklow smoked. So either way. So that's one thing to consider that he, I don't think he ran out of cigarettes, but he apparently depleted a, a book of matches. So that seems to indicate that uh, he was a regular smoker in my mind. The other thing that's interesting to know is when he boarded the jet uh, in Portland, uh, one of the first things he did is he ordered a bourbon and 7-Up from Florence Schaffner. This, of course, was before the, he was skyjacking the jet. And he paid for it with a $20 bill, just as he paid for his flight, his ticket from Portland to Seattle with a $20 bill. And Florence Schaffner asked him if he had anything smaller than a $20 bill, and he said no. I think the drink, if I'm not mistaken, was a $2 drink, was a two, two bucks. So uh, 
I think that's important. I'll get into that at another point that apparently D.B. Cooper was rolling with nothing smaller than 20s on him. And I think that indicates a number of things, which again, I'll get into later on. So a couple of important things to note. So that's it for today, folks, ladies and gentlemen. Again, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to shoot me an email, eric at ericulis.com. And until next time, as usual, cheers. <laughs>